Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Yeah, energy. Yeah, all right. I'm here to teach you how to cheat. I'm kidding. No, there's a good reason why it's called the cheat code, and I'll explain it in a second. Um, Latvia. Yes. Don't. Yes. Don't leave the country. Stay. There's so many opportunities here. It's a magnet. Uh, that's why I'm here. You know, funny. So you guys are probably wondering why there's a 15-year-old Asian guy on stage uh, talking about entrepreneurship and mobile. I'm actually from Canada. Um, from you guys like Canada, right? Everyone likes Canada too. Yeah. We, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then I left Canada, <laughs> um, and now I live in the U.S. But I keep on going back and seeing how my home country has grown in terms of its tech. Uh, community, because I'm in the tech space, and uh, obviously there's some amazing statistics that I'm sure get repeated time and time again. Like Latvia has faster internet than the U.S. and many of the developed countries in the world. But there's so many opportunities. Yes, you should be proud of it. That's because no one's using it. I'm kidding. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, anyways, all right, let's get started. So. Today I'm going to share with you a smattering of a lot of different things. One being my entrepreneurship story, the lessons I've learned along the way, uh, and a bit of Silicon Valley sprinkled in there because I spent eight years in Silicon Valley. I now live in in New York, um, and then because my company that I started is in advertising and media, I will be able to share with you something uh, to do with the future of advertising and media. And mobile, so everything together, you're gonna like it.、Um, so a bit of my background. So you're probably wondering again、uh, how I grew up, what、uh, what led me to here today.、Um, two things. Top is video games. Bottom is、uh, graphic design. So I played a lot of video games growing up,、uh, but eight hours a day at its peak playing Counter Strike. Yeah, Counter Strike. Yeah, and it is a good thing. And in fact, if you have kids that are playing video games, keep helping them play video games. And the reason is because it helped with my eye-hand coordination. Yeah, and it helped me be very efficient with using my computer and very strategic. So video games are good.、Um, your kids will thank me. And then I also did a lot of graphic design. So when I was 11, I, you know, pirated a copy of Photoshop because you can't afford it when you're 11 years old. And I taught myself how to design, and that's what got me into tech was graphic design. I knew I really couldn't draw with my hands, so I was like, why don't I use a computer to help me draw?、Um, so I started doing websites.、Um, I created a web design agency.、Um, so I actually skipped a few grades as well. So I skipped four grades. And went into university when I was 14, and then I graduated university when I was 18, and then started my company at 19. So a very compressed timeline.、Um, how I ended up getting into entrepreneurship was actually in this moment. So as a Canadian, I play ice hockey.、Uh, very cliche. Thank you, one person. Yeah. Oh, many more. Thank you. I know it's hard to believe, but I I can actually skate and shoot the puck.、Um, but I actually broke my knee on ice in a in a in an in incident, and I was in a wheelchair for a few months. And you know, when you can't move, you have a couple choices: you can play a lot of video games, which I was doing anyways,、um, or you could start a company. So that's when I decided to start a company. Uh, was when I couldn't move, you know. And they say go break a leg. I like broke my leg and then started a company. So, so I ended up starting Keep,、uh, and you're probably wondering what is Keep.、Uh, Keep was a very simple idea, which was, how many of you have ever looked at your phone and seen an ad, you know, on your phone, and intentionally tapped on that ad, right? Like, oh, one guy. Not a lot of people intentionally want to tap on an ad on their phone. It's it's a very Uh, frustrating thing because ads are interruptive, they're disruptive, they're not native. So came up with the idea of changing the ad to a reward. So instead of getting just an ad from a brand, what if a Coca-Cola were to reward you with something like a free Coke or content or something digital or 
anything you think could add value, points, you name it. So the idea was to replace an ad with a reward. In doing so, we created this model, which was called moments-based marketing, because instead of uh, just an ad that shows when you're scrolling along, we said on your phone, you do a lot of things. You, 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 know, you track your run you know, with your, your, your running apps, you take selfies, you, you match with people on, on dating apps, you, you uh, look at recipes, you do everything. So there's a lot of doing. So we call these doing things moments and said, what if a brand could just buy into a moment? And that's really been our advertising business. So today, we're in 11,000 apps. Uh, we don't make our own apps. We work with uh, 11,000 others. Um, we've raised 32 million in venture capital. Um, it's an eight-year-old company now, eight years old. I'm 27 now, so I started it when I was 19. So you do that math, it's in eight years of doing this. Um, so yeah, so this is what I was mentioning. This is Keep. It's moments advertising. Kind of cool, right? Like his ads, you know, what happened was when, when the phone became very popular, uh, brands were like, wow, the f most obvious thing I can see is that the screens just got smaller, right? So the TV went to the laptop, went to the phone. And so let's just make the ad smaller, you know? And so that, that's not the right type of thinking. That was very linear, not very sort of exponential or, or nonlinear thinking. So the trend that I noticed and why this, this business has become what it is today is because I believe we are all in this connected generation. Like I just talked about the internet connection, but it goes beyond that because we now have access to anything at our fingertips, right? So I know that Uber's not here yet. Get on it, Latvian government, but I know there's Taxify, that's great. But I know there's all these tools now that we're expecting uh, to be able to get things quickly, right? And it's not just by age group, it's just that everyone is always online. Very rarely are we now offline. And that means a lot of different things. We have these high expectations, but there's also different ways to interact. So when we looked at brands, again, uh, on TV, when you're sitting in your couch and you're watching an ad or a show that has an ad, it's fine, because it's once in a, in a little while. But if you get this many ads when you're on your phone, when you're really intimate with your device, it gets annoying. So we, we did some research and realized that. It's also a big problem. Ad blocking. How many of you actually use ad blockers to block ads on your, yeah, like this is already, it's a global phenomenon that almost 30 or 40% of people in the audience were like, I don't even want this stuff, but this is like, this is my industry, right? So a lot of disruption. So we realized that we had a really good business. We need to continue to evolve. And of course, I wanted to share with you something that we announced this week. I actually just came from, from Nice. I was at the Cannes Lions film, or not the film festival, the advertising festival, sorry. The film festivals for real celebrities, the Lions festivals for fake ones like us. Um, but we, we, we I'm kidding. Uh, it, it's an advertising creativity festival. We announced actually our blockchain solution. And I know that blockchain is, is a technology that many of you are curious about, and I know that there are startups in Latvia that are actively working on blockchain products. And it's just really cool to be able to be at the cutting edge and I encourage all of you to think about it that way. So we're in blockchain now, bam. But onto the good stuff. So the cheat code, why is it called the cheat code and why am I sharing these cheat codes with you? So in games, remember I told you that I played a lot of games growing up? You have cheat codes you can use to get ahead and get unlimited lives, you know, just that type of thing. And I was like, what if there are cheat codes for real life? And over the last eight years, I feel like there is these cheat codes. There's a bunch of them. In fact, there's 70 of them in my book. And I wanted to share some of these cheat codes with you. Uh, and I wanted to divide them on cheat codes that help you improve yourself, and then on your industry overall, whatever industry you're in, and then on others that you work with. I just think it'd be fun to share these things. You guys want to hear some cheat codes? Yeah? Cheat codes? Yeah! Yeah! Okay. Um, they're like life hacks, but you know, it's cooler to call them something controversial, like cheat codes, you know? Um, so the first cheat code is to know your superpower. And this is something that I think all of us is, bears a good reminder, is we, as we were growing up, were taught to try to spend time on the things we're not good at. You know, you get a B or a C 
You know, we're called Asians, not Bijans. So whenever I get a B, my parents would put me into a tutoring class. And then, you know, it just spends so much time on things that I'm not good at. But I think at this point, at any point in your career, knowing what you're really good at and putting all your energy into that is a very efficient allocation of your time. And for me, I know what I'm really good, good at. I'm really good at getting people super excited. You know, I just do this every day with customers, investors, employees. That's what I do. So I, I hone all my energy into that. I know what I'm not good at is anything that involves a spreadsheet. And I know it's hard to believe, but I'm not good at math. And then there are, there are people that I know that, of course, are complementary to that. And so putting together complementary superpowers is a big deal. And in fact, building teams in your own team, in your own executive organizations, if there's too many overlapping superpowers, it's not a good thing. You want to have complementary superpowers. The next cheat code for yourself is to use what you have. So too often, especially when I speak to uh, entrepreneurial audiences, younger folks, uh, you're all very young, of course. I'm saying that they'll come to me and say, oh, how do I get people to take me seriously? And I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to raise investment money. And I don't know if this customer is going to take me seriously. And I said, well, if you go in with that attitude, you already lost, right? If you have the opportunity to take what is traditionally perceived as a weakness and then turn it actually into a strength, that's a really powerful thing. Because that weakness, perceived weakness of youth, is not really one. Because the fact that you look really young is a really good thing. People expect you to be really digital, you know, because you've obviously grown up with Snapchat your entire life. They don't, they find you very benign, very harmless. So you can ask tons of questions, take as much information as you can. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. You have this unlimited energy, a lot of good things. Same thing with experience. People, again, will be like, well, I've been in the industry for a very long time. No one wants to hire an old guy. I'm like, no, they do. And I'll tell you why. Because you've done it before. You can save tons of time for folks. Always use what you have. And then also other people say, well, I'm all the way in Latvia, right? This is awesome. The cost of doing business here is obviously lower than doing business in New York and in San Francisco. And with such fast internet, you could pretty much be anywhere virtually. And that's why so many development houses are here and why there's so much engineering happening in this area of the world as well. It's really exciting. So again, taking your strengths and, or what you might even think is a weakness and turning into a strength is very powerful. The next is I find a lot of entrepreneurs have this trouble with what, what should I start or my company, what should I build? And the issue is there's no founder fit story, meaning they might come up to me and say, I want to do an, uh, a startup in AI and VR and AR and blockchain and any, all these hot you know, sort of things. And what I try to share is you have a story. Everyone has a story, right? Um, I was actually just in Bucharest last weekend at an event similar like this, and we met some founders. One of them was a beekeeper. He had decided to devote his life to beekeeping, but then realized that as a beekeeper, there wasn't any digital apps to help him make his job better. So he created an app for beekeepers, and it's like the most popular beekeeping app in the world. And, and like you think about that, and it just it makes so much sense. And so why I think it makes sense for you to look at your past is you can connect these things. Maybe you love building with your hands. Maybe you love classic cars. Maybe you love traveling. Maybe you love food. What are these things get fit together and make a better story? So for me, I share with you for a reason why I played video games and why I learned how to design. Because my company ended up being about video games, advertising, and design. It just all kind of makes sense that way. But again, you're not trying to force it. You know, It's not something you force to have happen. It's a very natural process. You don't like, wake up in the morning and be like, ee, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Like, it's gonna, it takes a, a, almost a generation. You know, it's about learning the habits and the mindsets. So my other favorite cheat codes, and this is applicable to everyone, I hope, is asking. I really hope we all love asking, just asking for something, asking for help, asking a customer, asking for money, whatever it is, just ask, because it's a superpower. Because if you ask the question and the answer is no, then your life wasn't any different before you asked the question, right? But if you ask the question and it's a yes, 
your life just changed. So ask more and more, and I find that, and that's why I came here. They asked me to come speak here, and I said, sure, I'm in Europe, this makes sense. So that's a very important skill that people just, for some reason, don't seem to leverage. Um, the second is, is related, is cold emailing. How many of you have guessed an email address of someone? Yeah, like first dot last name at company.com. Pretty easy, right? And you just guess emails and email CEOs and CMOs and COOs or whatever you want to email. Everyone has an email address in the corporate world now. You can reach practically anyone. And the good news is, in fact, the CEOs are typically the ones that get the least cold emails because everyone else is so hesitant to email them because they're like, oh, why would they want to respond? But you offer them something, say, hey, I have feedback for this, and da 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 da, and opportunities come. I knew no one when I moved to San Francisco. I moved to San Francisco in 2009. I knew no one. And I just emailed. I just built my own network. If you don't know someone, get to know them. It's, it's again, you are the most powerful force in your life. And then I love this thing, uh, LinkedIn Tinder. Have you guys ever played LinkedIn Tinder before? Hey, all of you have to be on LinkedIn, by the way. If you're not on LinkedIn, you do not exist. Um, what you do is you add a bunch of people on LinkedIn, <laughs> and if they accept your request, then it means they want to do business with you. It's just great, and if they don't, then they don't. It's fine. But again, don't like add everyone, but make sure they're relevant. Uh, I don't want to promote spamming, but you know what I mean. Again, the whole idea, the whole theme of this is use, you are the most powerful force in your life to create these opportunities. The next for yourself is to help foster the creative mind and one of the, the chapters in the book is actually go to museums. I know Latvia has like a lot of museums and I'm really excited to explore. And the idea behind this is that museums are a collection of greatness and history and helps you see things in a very convenient single spot. I believe a creativity comes from things you see. So if you're able to see more and more in an area that's been curated for you, you will get so much more inspiration. And it doesn't have to do with your job or your career or what you're focused on. Uh, seeking other areas to have your, I just love the whole wonder and awe and the huh. When it makes you think, your brain starts to create connections that leads to so many other ideas. I get most of my ideas for my own business when I'm traveling, right? Because I meet people from all cultures, from different backgrounds, and I get to be inspired by what drives them and then ultimately what drove me, and then try to make those connections. So our industry, so any industry, you could be in transportation, you could be in farming or agriculture, you could be in any industry, I wanted to share a few things. So the first is, if you're already in this category, try to evolve, so there's a really cool mindset. Not only is this cool for you, but it might scare you, but wake up in the morning once in a while and ask yourself, how am I gonna put myself out of business? It's a little scary, but this is the way that technology is affecting industries today. If we don't wake up in the morning and intentionally ask ourselves, what can I do to put myself out of business, someone might do it for you. And why that's important to think about is also how you evolve. For us, when we started, it was going into a category and creating a category, when I mentioned moments marketing, that didn't exist before. Right? And why I like this is because you get to set the rules. You get to create the category. But the danger of creating a category is that no one is in the category with you. And there's no, I mean, if you're the only person in the room, it's a little depressing and is a bad sign. But I'll give you an example. So Taco Bell, you guys have heard of Taco Bell. It's a very large fast food uh, chain in the U US. Um, tacos, uh, before Taco Bell came along, no one in America knew how to pronounce the word taco, right? And what happened was the founder of Taco Bell funded, he personally invested in another a company called Del Taco, which became Taco Bell's biggest competitor. Why would the founder of Taco Bell put money into the biggest competitor? Because he wanted both of them to educate the entire country about the category. So again, there's always an opportunity to create these categories. And then when you create these categories, and especially areas like blockchain, no one's an expert, right? Because you could be an expert today, but tomorrow you're not an expert anymore. Things change so fast. And so to be the best is just to learn just a little bit faster than the next guy. 
right? That is how you keep yourself ahead in this day and age. That's how I feel. Again, I'm painting a big lens of technology, right? Because I come from that space. If you come to me and you, you've been doing something really hardcore physical, I wouldn't know how to, to answer your questions because this has been my world is digital my entire life. Next is think big. Big. Really big. Because for us, when we pitched the original idea for Keep, it wasn't, oh, uh, let's put in-game rewards sponsored by brands into apps. No one would have understood that. We came up with this way to describe our vision, which was to create a rewards layer over the world where anything you could do could potentially be rewarded, and that reward could come from a brand. And by saying that, people were like, wow, that's really potentially big, but then I kind of get the immediate impact. Like, who doesn't want to get rewarded? But then the questions then come. How, what am I going to do to get rewarded? How are they going to pay for these rewards? Blah, 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 blah. But the whole point is at least it gets some thinking. So when you first come up with this idea, the idea of thinking on a bigger level, this vision component is something that I learned from Silicon Valley. We're very practical, I think, outside of really Silicon Valley. We're very like, okay, I want a business that's going to make money right away, and you know, we're going to be profitable, and that's just how we do business. This is the way I was, I was taught growing up. But for some reason, after I spent some time in Silicon Valley, the whole mentality is, we just want to go really big and capture an entire category, and maybe this will become a billion dollar business, or maybe it'll be nothing. Now, it's, obviously, there's a middle ground. It doesn't have to be that extreme. And I think there's ways of setting the vision big, but starting with something small. So, so the beekeeper guy, for example, if I talk to him, is like, what's your big vision? It's not be the biggest beekeeping app in the world. No, it'd be any professional services industry that involves livestock. They would be able to create a series of enterprise apps to help manage their livestock, because bees would be considered livestock in a way. I don't know. But the idea is, how do we create a bigger vision that helps them guide them into a bigger category and potentially bigger growth. My other uh, little cheat code is around you know, not being closely guarded, right? So another thing I learned back in Silicon Valley was everyone's very open to share. And you guys have heard of open source. Open source is really the spirit. It's the heartbeat of Silicon Valley. We want everyone to see everything because that fosters collaboration. An uh, engineer might see this code and go, oh, actually, we did it this way better, and let's just share. That's, that's how all of that was created. I think elsewhere in the world, I feel a lot of the times the culture is, well, I, I have my IP, my intellectual property, I have my patents, you know, I'm going to hold on to it, don't take it, right? And I think the idea of sharing is huge. And so don't be super secretive. And in fact, when, when we came up with the idea for Keep, I was asking everyone for feedback from my taxi cab driver, to my mom, to my Starbucks barista. I was like, what, what, what if you got a reward instead of an ad? And then they're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, you know? And then if you, if you get like a, you know, they all sounded like that. And then the, and if you get a bad uh, response, then you kind of take those things and you understand why people might not like it. And it's really good to get that immediate feedback. This is the next, and I think it's very applicable, and I'm glad uh, this is your 100th birthday. Happy birthday to... Uh, 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 Latvia, um, you guys are going to celebrate all year, right? I think after this year, the noise should not stop. You should keep banging that drum. And, and because it's rolling thunder, get it? And so what we do at Keep in our PR strategy is constantly having news, constantly being out there and top of mind. Because out of sight is out of mind. In this day and age, you know, Trump does something two days ago, Five hours later, we forget about it, and we go to, like, it seems like this, this North Korea thing was ages ago, but it was like literally four days ago or something. So the idea is there's a very quick media cycle, so the more you're in front of people, the more you get to be exposed to opportunities. And I think Latvia has that opportunity as a brand to be in front of so many people more frequently. And that, for me, we call it rolling thunder. So maybe internally in the government agency, you should call it Operation Rolling Thunder in terms of how many you know, stories of successes of entrepreneurs, uh, executives visiting San Francisco and New York and other big cities around the world, sharing about Latvia's strengths. That's the best part of rolling thunder. And that's something I learned from Americans. Americans are very loud. 
right? They love making noise all the time. No matter what, they'll invent awards for themselves just to give them an award, right? That's what the Grammys are. <laughs> they invent awards to make the industry pay attention to themselves and then the world to pay attention to them. It's amazing. It's really smart. I love it. All right, last category is with others. Cheat codes in working with others, especially in this day and age, in this modern business environment where many of you probably have employees or coworkers that are millennials. I know, we're there, we're working with you now and we're really hard to work with, I know, because we're lazy, we're on Instagram all the time, you know, we don't really do anything, I'm kidding. No, that's like a lot of bad reputation. But I think management has evolved as well. There was definitely the I tell you what to do uh, model for a very long time, very industrial. Uh, but over time, what we've seen is, is losing control. So for me, as an entrepreneur, again, I, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a control freak. I want everything to be the way I want it to be. But over time, it was about letting go and letting the team do their version of perfect because I found that my version of perfect very often was not as good as their version of perfect. And that empowerment is, is extremely powerful. And, and related to that, is this concept that I, I didn't coin this, you know, it already exists, but we, we kind of put it into practice by, by accident, by nature, which is subservient leadership or, or just being a servant to your employees. So when I ask them, when I catch up with them, right, when I have my one-on-ones, I don't say do these things, it's what can I do for you? What doors can I open for you? What resources do you need? What are your obstacles and how can I remove them? That's the new, I think, management style, is the managers are now the servants to the employees. It's, it's kind of radical, but this type of management style is, is mainly around helping allow the very independent, very creative, very building mindset, digital natives. These are the millennials that you have around you. We grew up in a world where we know that we can create something, like an app, and instantly distribute it to hundreds of millions of people around the world. In the years past, to be able to build something and reach 100 million people was a very, very hard concept to even fathom or even to understand. So that power at our fingertips, so that feeling of that power gives us this desire to build. And if given the range and the room to roam and to build, a lot of magical things would happen. And this is actually quite hard, but I find that today as well, if you don't do anything, it's much worse than doing something, especially with all the change in the ecosystem, and especially with our business. I like to tell folks if there's enough data that's been made into a graph to tell you if the decision you're making is the right decision, you're already too late. You're already too late. You have to make some decisions, some, not all, by the gut, and then be the rudder. And honestly, most of the time as a founder, as an entrepreneur, what you're doing is you're literally just going like, this. We're going to go that way. And then you walk that way, literally. And then you just lead them along and then maybe you walk off a cliff. But if you do, then you grow wings while you're falling off the cliff. And that's the way of the entrepreneur. And it's scary, but it is why there's so much happening right now that's exciting and invigorating and so exhilarating. And this is why our industry is so, so fun. So the next one here, I think my final one, is gratitude. So, you know, I have to remind us uh, about where we are today, right? Um, uh, my mom and dad, they immigrated from Hong Kong. Uh, that's why I look like this. And, uh, and I asked my mom and dad a few years ago, I said, hey, uh, oh, my mom is a nurse, by the way, and my dad is an accountant, nurse and an accountant. And I asked them, why did you become a nurse and an accountant? And they said stability, because they figured that, you know, because they came from, from a time uh, in Hong Kong where the economic stability was non existent. It was crazy. So they said, I wanted, we, being a nurse and being an accountant are probably two of the most stable jobs you could get. And the reason why they did that was so that my brother and I could grow up in an environment where all we had to worry about was to get good grades, right? And to not get yelled at, pretty much. And that's amazing, and I feel like many of you have fought yourself very hard 
and maybe your parents or your, their parents before them have fought really hard, really, really hard, in many, many ways, to be able to give us this environment where all we really need to do is sit in an air-conditioned office and come up with cool ideas, that's, I mean, or type on a keyboard. And the, this is like, you know, that's, we should be very grateful to that, but not only grateful, but not waste it. So if you're gonna take that, that platform, I would say, that you were given, this privilege that we have, and to waste it on doing something very boring and mediocre, that's really bad. Take this opportunity you've been given. Take the time and era we're in today and go build amazing things. Try to push the envelope. Try to create your future. You know, my favorite quotes, you know, involve some version of the, you know, if you want to be able to uh, get to the future, you should create your own. And Elon Musk always says this. He's, the reason why he's doing this thing for, for Tesla and SpaceX and flying people to Mars is he just doesn't want a future that's depressing. Like he says this all the time. I don't want to look at the future and think of it and I get really depressed. It's like we want to, yeah, we should go to Mars. We should do cool stuff. And that's honestly, you know, sometimes people will go, well, I need to have unlimited resources. But sometimes you can start small, inspire the world, and resources from around the world can now come together because of what we have in front of us, this interconnected web, this fact that everyone is connected to each other, and the fact that we're in this time and era where we can do this, is extremely powerful. And I think one of the best places to do it in the world is Latvia. Thank you very much.